My argument is not that traditional public schools are, are doing fantastic. They are plagued by problems as well. My conclusion actually is now we have two systems of schooling plagued by serious problems. So the reformers really love New Orleans. Pre-hurricane, 3% of the students in charter schools. Post-hurricane by 2010, 71% of the students in that district in charter schools. Meaning it's the highest percentage of charter school children in anywhere in the United States. So it's an experiment. The development of charter schools, especially when big business is involved, will add to the inequity, is likely to add to the inequity. We will not just sit by and watch this happen. Uh, let me begin by sharing with you some uh, factual information I came across. This was from the New York Times in February of uh, this year. Um, the quote is, statewide only 10% of students at charter schools graduated in 2009 at college-ready standards. Now, putting aside the, the loaded language of college-ready standards <coughs> and putting, puting aside all the many flaws of standardized tests, if one accepts those things just for a moment, uh, we should take stock of what, what does it mean that only 10% of students at charter schools graduated in 2009, even if one wants to make the argument that it was just as bad or just as low as traditional public schools. I think it's hard to argue that this is a, a good graduation rate. New York Times, February 2011. Uh, this is from the uh, New York State Education Department press release, um, March 24th. Uh, NYSED, New York State Ed Department, placed KIDS, which is the acronym for a charter school, on probation for incurring, and I quote, significant unbudgeted expenses, failure to achieve tax exempt status from the IRS, repeatedly taking out loans and paying staff and outside agencies late, it was also cited for operating without a principal since January 4, opening 10 days behind schedule in September, having a high turnover rate, and lacking sufficient materials and teachers to properly educate students. So NYSED shut them down. The reason I share this particular example is because all of this stuff, or pieces of it, are happening at many charter schools across the state and across the country. Uh, my argument is not that traditional public schools are, are doing fantastic. They are plagued by problems as well. My conclusion, actually, is now we have two systems of schooling plagued by serious problems. Um, Chester Finn, as you may or may not know, is a, is a major advocate of charter schools. And one of the things he says is that uh, uh, special education, if special education comes to charter schools, he says, I quote, uh, charter schools will go bankrupt. The whole logic, the whole idea is that special ed students are too expensive, too high needs, and because charter schools, for profit and not for profit, don't want to really deal with that, then they don't deal with that, then they don't go bankrupt. So this is Chester Finn, a charter school advocate, basically explaining why uh, special ed students are enrolled at a disproportionately low level in charter schools across the country. Uh, for what it's worth, there are roughly, roughly 5,400 charter schools enrolling approximately 1.7 million students in the United States. Charter schools are in, charter school laws are in 40 states, D.C. and Puerto Rico. I believe 39 states actually have charter schools. And a huge push is being made to expand charter schools north, south, east, and west in the United States. Charter schools are exploding, expanding geometrically and exponentially, regardless of what the evidence says. Charter schools are expanding extremely rapidly. Arne Duncan, who is also a major advocate of charter schools, through teleconference at the 2010 National Conference of Charter School Association, uh, said to the charter schools, uh, operators at the conference that we have to take some of the criticisms of charter schools seriously otherwise we're going to have even less credibility than we have and he specifically told the charter school operators and there is several thousand in attendance and this is again a pro charter school advocate he specifically told the people in attendance that uh, one of our weak points one of our Achilles heel is the special education piece uh, it's well known well established the facts speak quite loudly that special ed students are 
enrolled in charter schools at an extremely low rate. Uh, there are some charter schools that are specifically for special ed, but those are definitely the exception. And when the charter schools do enroll kids with special uh, abilities or disabilities, uh, the literature shows consistently it's of the mild variety of disability. It's not the severe disabilities. Interestingly, um, also back in February 2010, you may have caught this, you may have missed this, the New York Times reported that a panel of roughly 10 charter school advocates, again, this is the charter school folks talking, testified before Congress. Charter school advocates testified at, congressional, at a congressional hearing on revising No Child Left Behind to urge lawmakers to include more oversight of charter policies on number one, admissions, academics, and finances as part of the government's broader push to increase financial support of the schools. So here are charter school advocates coming before Congress on the eve of reauthorization of NCLB and saying, look, there are a lot of problems in the charter school movement on this front, this front, and this front, and we want you to exercise more oversight over charter schools. Um, they go on to say, one advocate noted, and watch the numbers here, that a $2 billion influx of federal aid for charter schools in recent years was supported by less than $2 million for oversight. $2 billion versus $2 million. So tons of money for charter schools, especially in the form of startup seed money, etc. But very, very little money for oversight for overseeing, for monitoring, for supervision. Even with weak oversight, even with weak supervision, over 650 charter schools have been shut down since their inception in 1991. Minnesota, the home of the original charter school law and charter school system, uh, the state auditor, state inspector, auditor general, some guy with this kind of title over there, basically uh, concluded that um, oversight of charter schools in Minnesota is very weak and very lax, as is the case in many states. And uh, he said, we're going to revamp the law. And when they revamped the law, uh, a whole bunch of authorizers said, uh, we're not even going to bother to reapply and stay in the business. We're just going to forget it. We're out of here. Because the standards were a little bit higher, a little bit stricter, and I would say a little bit more useful. So besides that problem, the other problem that comes up is now what happens to the charter schools that were authorized by those authorizers that are now gone. A similar situation just unfolded in the state of Georgia about 10 days ago where the Georgia State Supreme Court ruled that the charter school commission established there was unconstitutional and that only local school boards in the state of Georgia can authorize charter schools. And so now the problem comes up, among many problems, what happens to the students and the charter schools that were authorized by this entity that was deemed unconstitutional and now apparently has to go out of business. Um, let's see. So two billion for charter schools, two million for oversight. And here's a quote this one guy says, it's as if the federal government had spent billions for new highway construction but nothing to put up guardrails along the sides of those highways. In the Atlantic Monthly in 2007, James Huger, chairman of Lafayette Academy Charter School in New Orleans said, I'm a real estate developer. I don't know the first thing about running a school. He is representative of many individuals and groups who start charter schools. So whatever one thinks, feels, and believes about charter schools, the harsh and cold reality is that you have these individuals who are really not in education or about education, but are very much driven by maximizing profit and are very comfortable uttering statements like this. Um, over 20 teachers and 200 students left that school in its first year. That level of staggering turnover is also representative of many, some might say most charter schools, 
in the United <coughs> States. So I just wanted to start with this sort of backdrop of examples, and mainly from pro-charter school folks, revealing that they recognize that there are cracks and weaknesses within the movement, and that there's a need to deal with the criticism that has been targeted against charter schools for 19, 20 years. I should mention that there are about 98 for-profit <coughs> education management organizations operating 729 schools in 31 states. Over 93% are charter schools. And the student body total number is over 350,000 for these schools. But also interesting is if one takes seriously this notion of adequate yearly progress, uh, half are not even making adequate yearly progress. So that's sort of back to that first fact I gave where less than 10% of students graduate at so-called college ready standards from charter schools. In other words, if there's a lot of outrage over scores on flawed tests at traditional public schools, one could say, well, where's the outrage over similarly poor results on flawed tests at charter schools? And again, I return to my conclusion, and I'm trying to be brief and very summative here, that, that we now have two systems of schooling plagued by serious problems. And I'm seeing a lot more books and a lot more articles with the word hype and even the word hope in them. And the general gist, the general sentiment is that the charter schools are overhyped, overreached, overextended, overinflated, uh, promising so much but not delivering what is promised. Maybe you realize or maybe you remember, I don't I can't even remember, maybe it was a month or two ago, I had a piece in the DNC on some basic factual information about charter schools. Let me quickly review that. And please keep me on track, Mary. Uh, one of the things to appreciate about the problems in charter schools is that teacher, student, principal, and staff turnover is not only very high, but much higher than turnover for <coughs> teachers, students, and principals in traditional public schools. And some of the reasons are obvious. People are young, experienced, easy to exploit burn out very easily, so then they leave. Generally speaking, we all know that we don't stay at a place where the conditions are lousy. We do, however, stay at a place where you feel supported, the pay is good, the conditions are good, and so on and so forth. And we've got a lot of research now, and more coming out, detailing and exposing the turnover rate in charter schools. Um, in some cities, the charter school turnover rate for students is 50%. In Ohio, four years in a row, the turnover rate for teachers, uh, over 40% every single year. That's representative, actually. It's not that unique. Uh, principal turnover, I'll give you a conservative figure, over 60% in charter schools. In fact, it's not an accident, it's not unusual to hear of a charter school where they've been around five years, but they've gone through three, four, five, or six principals in that time. And what the researchers have found is that it isn't teachers coming into charter schools and just, hey, let me, let me get my feet wet and then I'll go to a traditional school where there's more security and better resources. It's actually the conditions of work are very poor, especially compared to conditions of work in regular schools. So people are leaving for actual reasons of conditions in those schools. Um, a significant percentage of teachers in charter schools don't have to be certified. In New York State, it's up to 30%. It varies by state. It depends on the laws. I tell this to my students at Nazareth, who are teacher education students, have certification or pursuing certification, and it's, it's uh, usually quite upsetting, usually quite disappointing to hear that they're here for certification, but you can teach without certification in a charter school. Uh, principals at charter schools tend to get paid very, very well compared to their peers in traditional public schools, and thus the disparity in pay between principals and teachers is quite high. Um, very significant, perhaps, Mark will talk about this. One of the ways that charter schools, for-profit and not-for-profit, 
eliminate public interest, public right, and public will is through the phenomenon of the school board. Everyone knows that a traditional public school has a school board made up of people who at least have to have the pretense of running for elected office. They, can, they campaign, they go door to door, they, I love kids, I, want, I love sports, I love, I'm going to improve education, so on and so forth. Uh, a charter school is not run by a school board. Modeled after the corporation, it's run by a board of trustees. And these individuals are not publicly elected individuals. And this is one of the ways that the public, or public interest and public right, is removed through the mechanism of charter schools. Another way, of course, is through the outright privatization and operation of charter schools by for-profit companies. And it's basic logic that the for-profit companies are there for, for profit. They're not first and foremost for education and educational quality. Uh, it's very easy to go on and on and on with all the various dimensions and aspects of charter schools, but I want to be mindful of my time. Probably talk to by now, Mary. Okay. So, okay, let me go on just one more minute. <laughs> <laughs> go on one more minute, and then we'll, we'll defer to Mark here. Um, I've seen different numbers. I've seen anywhere from 88% to 94% uh, charter schools are deunionized schools. Uh, moreover, the charter schools that do have unions tend to have dilute or weak unions, unions without teeth. And of course, we know a union implies a collective bargaining agreement, and of course, we are living now in the post-World War II tear up collective bargaining agreements, tear up the social contract, and put everything on a new neoliberal anti-social footing where narrow private interests dominate, dominate the scene today. So that's quite a significant aspect to appreciate as well, that the removal of unions also facilitates the whole emphasis on cost cutting that the uh, for-profit sector is quite frankly obsessed with. All right, one more, and I'll defer to Mark. Um, we've heard that uh, charter schools siphon away millions of dollars from traditional public schools. And there's no way for those traditional public schools to actually make up the money that they lose, because the, the scale of the loss and the rate and the nature of the loss of the money is such that the schools need to continue to provide ventilation, heating, a classroom teacher, and so on and so forth. It's not like Mrs. Jensen in sixth grade is teaching a class of 30 and 25 leave to go to a charter school and therefore we can close that room and close that building and lay off Mrs. Jensen. It's like three or four students from Mrs. Jensen's class and then four or five students from Mrs. Clark's class leave. But then we have to keep that same room, we have to pay that same teacher, we have to have the same resources, ventilation, infrastructure. And then this becomes an added expense and burden to the traditional public school that's chronically underfunded anyway, and in effect is being set up to fail even more, even faster. And that feeds into the logic, if you can call it logic, of the charter school model. I'll stop there and uh, defer to Mark and then look forward to some great discussion. Well, we attended two hearings for um, Charter two schools. new charter schools that are being proposed in Rochester. One of the points we made is that it's difficult to speak intelligently to these proposals since we don't have any of the details. And so all we can do is speculate based on the information that we've seen reported in the media previously. When we go down this road of uh, having uh, charter schools that involve private businesses and so forth, we end up sometimes with situations such as uh, that which exists in New Orleans where for all practical intents and purposes, they have two public school centers. Almost half the children of New Orleans now attend charter schools. And those charter schools are, are very, um, they, they have a lot more resources than the traditional public schools. So the have and have not dichotomy is becoming very, very clear in places like New Orleans. It's not the only place, so that's one of the most outstanding places. My name is Mark Garrison. I'm from Buffalo. I teach at a college called Legal College. I'm currently director of doctoral programs there and also head up an educational leadership doctoral program uh, where I routinely give my students bad news 
as uh, Shaggy was so kind to do. <coughs> there's one thing that he said, which I'd like to begin with, and, and maybe challenge him and all of you a little bit. He said, there's two systems, and they both have flaws. I say, where's the second system? We know the old system, the one that's criticized, the one that we all have experience with growing up. But is that second thing called charter schools actually a system? And I think if we examine New Orleans and look at it, and we ask ourselves, is what's there a system, meaning that there's a whole and all the various parts function together for a common purpose? Is that purpose, whatever that purpose will be nefarious or a good purpose, a purpose we like, or a purpose that serves only the interests of the few, nonetheless it's a system that functions to serve that purpose. Are the schools that exist in a state under a single law with multiple authorizers, is that a system? And why is that significant? Another question to begin, how I'm thinking about it is, uh, you often hear charter schools are public schools. <clears throat> well, first of all, why does one need to say such a strange thing? Bananas are yellow. Why do we have to affirm that? So, one case in point in Illinois, charter school operators, EMO, that is, charter schools operated by educational management organizations that uh, take in public funds and try and run the school for less than what, uh, the, less the, the cost, they spend less to make a profit. They have gone to court to argue that in fact they are private institutions and once the money is in their hands, that's private money. Well, what does that mean? Why is that significant? So what I've been interested in, not just with charter schools, but a lot of the things that I've been studying is how are current reforms taking place in education related to broader changes in our political system? I'm not talking about the tactical decision of parents who may or may not send their kids to a charter school. And we all know that all of us, to various degrees, depending on who we are, our class, our race, our gender, our level of education, are constrained in our choices and opportunities. And so we all have feeling for people as they struggle to find the best they can for their families. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about aggregate patterns and historical change at the level of institutions. I believe that we can't analyze the significance of charter schools or teacher merit pay or high stakes testing outside the larger context of thinking, how is this changing our political system? Because I believe that uh, one, of the, one of the contradictions we face in having these discussions and debates about charter schools or testing is that one side says we're going to go forward with irrational plan A. And we all, the rest of us, whoever we are, say, no, the facts don't support irrational plan A. All the facts support we don't do that. And then the side says, well, we're going ahead with the rational side A anyway. What does that suggest is the problem? Facts or who holds power? Mm -hmm. It suggests that the problem is who holds power. And we know that in the United States, the question of who holds power has been related and organized relative to who gets schooled and who doesn't get schooled. So let's problematize the issue of what is public and what is private when we're thinking about charter schools. Historically, the designation of public and private was not only connected with school boards, but it was also connected to racist segregation. Public and private are designations about who has access to what and demarcates who's a member and who's not a member, who has a claim and who doesn't have a claim. And these content, public and private, change over time historically relative to people's struggle for their rights, struggle for their culture, struggle to be affirmed, right? Now, all of this is about affirming people so that they can participate and so on and so forth, basically what we would like to think is democratic aspirations, and we know and all believe, although we all have different ideas about it, that schooling and education more generally has a relationship to these democratic aspirations. So that's how I'm thinking about it. The reason I was interested in New Orleans is not simply out of the great concern one has for the folks there, who it should be said in a forum such as this, that the real crime wasn't of nature, but of the government, who not only neglected Okay, since 1998, possibly sooner we knew about the levies, the government was warned about the levies. When the levies failed, not only were the people not assisted, they were attacked and forcibly removed by gunpoint. And most of those people were a particular kind of people. So one of the things that you'll see, let's get this out of the way right now. I have a report here from the Hoover Institute's Education Next. It's actually very useful to read. Uh, everyone know who the Hoover Institute is? I don't think I'm right. Just go look it up. <laughs> you know, what might be called a right-wing think tank, but very useful to study. They talk about the tremendous growth in test scores of charter schools in New Orleans. So, I'll argue for three reasons that we shouldn't discuss those kinds of things at all. And in New Orleans, I'll tell you why. One, we know that under a current high-stakes testing environment that there's fraud, fraudulent data. 
Okay? Pe people cheat. For good, we can justify it, we can oppose it, it's a fact that happens, so the scores become invalid. Two, when you teach to the test, it invalidates what that test score is supposed to mean. Okay? So then there's no correlation between the substance of the curriculum and the test score. Such, just like the stocks go up and down, remember who's driving this, the stocks go up and down, it doesn't really correspond to how we're doing in the economy. Right? It doesn't correspond with reality. There's too much research showing that the fluctuation of the test scores doesn't correspond to a substantive notion of education or a substantive notion of uh, development or even basic skills and, and whatnot. Okay? We can debate that. Here's the kicker. And this is why New Orleans is really important. Something happened after the hurricane. And what happened is, is that the people who live there are different. And the difference correlates with changes in test scores. So we have whiter people, richer people, and fewer people in New Orleans than we did prior to the hurricane. 60,000 students pre, 40,000 post. Now 71% of those students are in charter schools. Their scores are going up. Now I haven't actually analyzed the raw data. Sorry, but my guess is that it went up for those three reasons. And so I don't want to discuss test scores in charter schools because I don't think it's useful. What I want to discuss is public issues, private issues, and governance issues. So that gives you background of where I'm coming from. Now, New Orleans uh, is important not only because, uh, well, let's start historically. New Orleans and, and Louisiana is very important in the formation of the United States because it's really the first time this issue of what it means to be an American came up. And if you read the history of the Louisiana Purchase, what you find is how white Anglo-Saxon people were talking about the people who lived there as other, as needing to be Americanized. And interestingly enough, the common school reformer named Horace Mann, who built and helped implement the architect of the, the, the public school system we used to know before uh, what's going on today happened, was brought down to New Orleans to implement a system there that modeled what was in the North prior to the Civil War. The belief was that the people there, which are multiple types of people, you had a, a very, you know, the history of New Orleans is itself interesting, and I don't think to be an expert on it, but we know that it's unique, but it raises the issues of what it means to be American, and that's how it was talked about. And they wanted a system that they believed could solve that problem. In other words, the people themselves couldn't be in control of their own education. And I'm not saying that means it's always right, but it's an important principle to say one has control over their life. That would include the education of your children. And so one needs to sort that out. It wasn't sorted out in a way that I would describe as democratic, even though common schools of the middle of the 19th century were given as the American idea of education for equality. That idea, I believe, has come to its full end. And I don't defend that idea in opposing what's going on today, whether it's charter schools, privatization, high stakes testing, teacher, mayor, pay, blah, blah, blah. I think what we need to do is think anew about it. The third thing is that the reformers, and we put that in quotes, right? Um, just as a side note, I think reform is the new McCarthyism, because anytime you say anything against reform, you're anti-reform! Like, you know, take me away like I'm a communist or something. I don't think we should talk about reform. I think we should name the thing we're talking about. Are we talking about how to evaluate teachers? Well, let's talk about it. Let's not talk about reform. Let's just talk about the thing we're talking about. Mm -hmm. So the reformers really love New Orleans. Who just went down there? Arne Duncan went down there. And he called up people on the State Board of Education and told them who they should elect as the next State Board Superintendent. John White. John White's 35. Guess where John White got his experience? Chicago. Guess what teacher organization he taught for for two years? Teach for America. Guess where he got his administrative experience? Under Bloomberg in New York City where he shut down schools. And he's like, Arnie, he's really white and nice. He says, I'm here to help. Well, if you were here to help, I can say, thanks for coming, but no thanks, but we don't need you. So if I still stay, then we, there's something else going on here. There's another problem. So that's why New Orleans is important. Real quick history. And this is important. Everybody knows, before the hurricane, the discourse was these schools are failing. They're corrupt. There's a lot of problems. Uh, and they're multifaceted, they're historic, and they're systemic. They're related to other things outside the schools. What's the one thing we're not allowed to talk about because if we do, we're accused of having excuses? Poverty. And what's the thing that has grown tremendously in the last five years as people are kicked out of their homes? It's a very important thing to deal with the various forms of social inequality that create tremendous, uh, really, crimes against people. It's very, you have to imagine, you know, we, you know, we face our own struggles, but it's extremely, it's extremely uh, significant. 
Okay? We're not allowed to talk about that. So New Orleans, which had all these problems. The first law to take over the schools was in 1990. It didn't come about because of Hurricane Katrina. And you read the news narratives now, and they make it sound like the hurricane came and they said, oh boy, we better intervene to help the people there. Not what happened. 1995, first state charter school law. Every year after, they modified that law to have charter schools. Pre-hurricane, 3% of the students in charter schools. Post-hurricane, by 2010, 71% of the students in that district in charter schools. Meaning it's the highest percentage of charter school children in anywhere in the United States. So it's an experiment. Is that a system? Next, we have uh, test scores. This is never told to you. And it's very interesting. Um, when you go to these educational conferences where they do research, most of the people there, you know, whatever. But sometimes you find these principals who come from New Orleans and they try and say, look, we really did increase test scores over the last three years. And that was ignored. What's interesting is that the schools who participated in whatever reform plan they had before, I don't remember the details, were actually showing significant, using the test scores, improvement. Okay, so this law is already in place to have the recovery school district, and that's important. Okay. The, the takeover proposal, based on the scores, is prior to the hurricane. They actually have some discussion during the summer about taking over the schools between the mayor and the state and other constituencies. Very important. A month after the storm, Heritage Foundation immediately says what we need is vouchers. Margaret Spellings comes in. $20 million for charters, zilch for anything else. I went to New Orleans twice once uh, uh, soon after, not you know, the following year in August, and I did a tour, and there's two things that are very important. One is that all the public housing was destroyed by the hurricane, and therefore we had to demolish it. Not true. Inch less. It was, it was, it was, it was fine. Relative, I'm not saying it was acceptable. I'm saying relative to what it was before, it didn't need to be destroyed. They said all the school buildings were wiped out. Not true. They weren't destroyed all by the hurricane. They had this firm come in, like, you know, uh, you don't have the emergency financial manager thing here. We have one in Buffalo. We have a control board. They had a firm come in to manage the schools, fire all the teachers, close the schools down, sell off the assets of the district. This was going on right before the hurricane, and it was stepped up <coughs> afterwards. So then those schools needed to be rebuilt. It's a lot of with, with FEMA money, but also foundation money. Uh, the Algiers community, which is... Uh, I think was maybe eight schools, immediately converted to a charter school. So now at this time you're starting to see there's things happening real quick. I mean, I think at that time, you know, most of the people were gone. There wasn't anyone there. They fired all the teachers, did I tell you that? The teachers were fired because there was an emergency. So we're going to fire them. And this was obviously related to the other trend, which whether you're anti-union or pro-union, I think it's hard to render anything else than with the current context being sort of against unions. Whether you think that's good or bad isn't my point, but there's a definite trend. Okay, that's what's going on. We have uh, another key thing is that there was the thing called Lusher Academy, and it was connected to Tulane University. And it was for the parents. It was a public school, and it was for the parents of that university. People like myself, whose kids went there, and it was probably very, you know, it was nice. Immediately converted to a charter school to protect their interests. Tulane president played an important role in bringing about foundations, and national school reformers to New Orleans. One community action group described it was a feeding frenzy. Everyone from outside came to New Orleans, just like Horace Mann did, to tell them what they should do. And it was these foundations, the Broad Foundation. Everyone know who the Broad Foundation is? <laughs> All right, see, that's good. That took about 20 years for us to get people to know. The Broad Foundation, the Gates Foundation is even more important. Very important, right? So these people, new schools for New Orleans, Teach for America, New Teachers Fund, all of these groups and front groups, okay, were being organized. Now, when I say organized, I mean they're, they're part of a political action group, just as you seem to have had a political action group in terms of your form the last time in Rochester. Nothing wrong with that. But it raises the issue of who's deciding and on what basis do you decide. They decide based on who's got the cash and the influence, not based on anything else. So let's go on a little bit. We're, uh, what you need to know is that there's basically now, this goes back to my original question about is it a system? Um, if you were a parent in New Orleans, and there's, you can go dig up the archives on NOLA.com and you'll find, even on that uh, forum, parents who are saying, I don't understand where to send my kid to school. Does, does my kid have a school? Okay, so there's there's district-wide. Nothing. You can go to any school you want in the district. Some are overseen by the recovery school district. 
Some of the recovery school district schools are traditional public schools. Some are, uh, I think there's maybe 16, we'll just go, I'll get to the actual numbers. It's pretty even. That the recovery school district is the district that took power away from the Orleans Parish School District following the state law that was implemented post-hurricane. Okay, so with the state is it came and said we're taking it over. We're taking it over 107 of I think 116 schools. We're leaving those the ones that are better performing with the Orleans Parish. And then they systematically worked. Let's see with the little charters to convert many of the schools to charters. And these charters have two basic models. One is the CMO. The CMO is the Charter Management Organization. KIPP would be one that you're probably most familiar with. There's two KIPP schools in New Orleans right now. And these are non-for-profit, but highly connected to Broad money, Gates money, and other forms of money. And they are, depending on where they are, related to real estate developers. So the actual deal is the board of directors and the real estate developers interlock. And so what you do, I mean, from a, from a financial, that's a good, maybe we should start one, right? You get the state money, and then the state money gets paid to the real estate developers as rent for the property. And then those people direct the school. So it's a good way to secure lots of income. And then you have a lobby arm, like they're doing in Ohio now, and I'm not kidding, this isn't New Orleans, but this is important. They have a law. I swear it says there should be no oversight of charter schools whatsoever. I'm serious. So we have the recovery school district, and here we have 37 charter schools and 33. This is actually as of the end of 2010. There may, may have been changes already given race to the top. It's, it's, I will, as you all know, it's hard to find accurate information using the existing mainstream media sources because you have to separate what's being promoted and what's actually the facts. So that means sometimes you have to read laws and these sorts of things. But I think this is, this is reasonably accurate for discussions today. We have two independent charters that are authorized by the... Uh, board of S Elementary and Secondary Education at the state level, Bessie. So there's two authorizers. Then you have the Orleans Parish School District, which is the school, we would, their parish is our district, a parish district. So Rochester City Schools would be a parish. Okay? And that's an authorizer. And in that, they have traditional public schools and charter schools. And within all of those charter schools, you have CMOs and EMOs. So K-12.org, uh, Bennett's, you know, sort of homeschooling charter company. There's some schools there that's managed by K-12.org. There's some that are KIPP charter schools. There's organizations that seem to be connected to local folks in New Orleans who started CMOs, but they, they have, um, they know right away when it's a really sexy website that something's going on here. And I develop websites. It's a lot of work to do that well. So as an example, we have NOLA 180, which is a charter management organization. It's not, it probably has a non-for-profit legal status but it's connected to all the key players that they proudly display. So as an analogous one, our now our, our uh, commissioner of education in New York State is King. King comes, comes from Uncommon Schools. Okay, Uncommon Schools is connected to all the same people, plus a bunch of venture uh, funds and, and, and hedge fund managers and these types of people. Now that doesn't make it bad in itself, but what it suggests to us is how the governance structure is changing. Okay. So when we say privatization, I'm starting to think, you know, it's confusing because they think it's all about making money. So I don't think these folks in this school are necessarily all about making money. There's something else going on. They're actually a wedge to change the governance structure. And what's the key thing in changing that governance structure? So let's talk a little bit about that because I probably have like 10 minutes left. No, <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, let's see. Uh, I think we should continue on the path and uh, everything would be good. But just let me say this. You'll know that one of the key things about charter schools is that it eliminates the notion of neighborhood school and a claim. Yeah. And it, it eliminates residency. And when it does this, it says there's two basic key things. One, everything should be based on test scores unless we don't like the results. And two, it should be based on separating the authorization of the school from the provision of the service. And that's their language is service. So underlying, if you go back 10 years and read Frederick Hess, and these other people are trying to come up with the ideological framework to think about this. The old system under Horace Mann linked funding with democratic control. And the new system wants to draw a line between that, and serve the public purpose, access for minorities, and so on and so forth. But the provision is private because it's more efficient. And we can't take the charter schools away for all the teachers here. The charter schools are about driving down wages of teachers. That's, what, that's part of how they're going to be part of this new system.
Because uh, Mary, so she had recommended. Oh, I right. want to ask you, uh, Doctor. Sure. What's your name? Yeah. Mark. Okay. Mark. Okay. Doctor Mark. Doctor Mark. Mark. That's How do you respond to people who point to the fact that charter schools were designed to help reform public education? Well, the first thing I would say is uh, what they're designed to do, what they're doing. I would say, well, first of all, what does reform mean? I think charter schools are changing public education. I think there's no doubt about that. Uh, and I think reform language is content free, just like the language of change. Is so the second thing is, is that if you mean, not you, but whoever says it, change meaning something positive, like more kids graduate, they go on to college, they become happy, productive citizens, those sorts of things. I would say that the preponderance of the evidence, even if I'm being conservative, suggests that at a minimum, we should stop expanding them and assess the situation. If I was to tell you what I think, I would say there's absolutely no evidence in the world that the problem was the lack of competition. The existence of charter schools is premised on the idea that the system didn't work because elected governance gives rise to inefficiencies, and the way to improve the system is by having it operate like a free market. I would argue, based on the experience of 2008, that the free market doesn't work very well, and that we don't need more of it. Uh, Mark. Mark Friedman, a member of the Community Education Task Force and a teacher. And um, to give kind of a context to my question, we just came from um, a, a kind of public hearing in which the Rochester City School, Bus, uh, School Board facilitated, I guess you would say, um, public or community concern and questions and comments on the authorization or upcoming authorization for two, uh, for two charters that will operate within the city school district here. And our comments were relayed to the Board of Regents, one of the authorizers right in New York State. So something that frequently came up from people like Malik Evans or Ben White or other board members on the city school district is that this is this is out of our hands, we're independent of this, this is this is a state issue, right? And that we as a school board, they're trying to kind of walk the line and, and kind of frame it as that they're independent, that they're imbibed, that they're not going to take a stance on that. So as a city school district board, what is your kind of stance on that in terms of is that, what, what's your thoughts on that? For either one. I'm not even sure I, I quite understand. <coughs> the city school board is, is saying we have nothing to do with the establishment of the zero charter schools. We're, we're independent. This is a process. This is outside of our hands. Okay, and where are the charter schools supposed to be housed and located in? That, that's a critical question because before Chicago superintendent left town, he was discussing the possibility of one of those schools being located in Franklin High School. So if it is, in fact, yeah. we don't know though. So there's not, we were speaking at the hearing like ignorant people because we don't have any details. So, but if, if we said to them, if that is the case, then you have everything to do with it, whether or not that charter goes into a public Rochester school, but we don't know. We yeah, I mean, it would say, if the schools are being authorized by someone other than the school district, they may be technically right and say, that's their point. We have nothing to do with it. The Board of Regents is authorizing it. And like the other charter schools, they operate independently. Right. If, on the other hand, the groundwork is being laid, to have these charter schools encroach upon the school district and seize facilities and seize services, which it sounds like, then of course they have something to say about it. Of course they should say something about it. And probably learn to let this be a better example of the co-location system uh, in your rises. This is my clarification. I think it's true, though I'm not sure in New York State law, the school district has a de facto oversight role, if not an authorizing role. Schools within the district, the district has a, for instance, a district official can walk into the charts. Just for quick, um, New York City and Buffalo do, but the other five, they don't. Are, sure. They don't have a direct oversight, and that's their claim that we don't authorize it and that we don't. But that, 
Then my second point would be what I said before, which is what kind of system that claims to be in favor of kids and families doesn't allow them to have any say over the authorization of all the schools in their neighborhood. It's fraudulent. Thank you. My name is Ed Brockenbrow. I'm at the Warner Graduate School of Education. There you go. Given the momentum that's behind the charter school movement, I think we're increasingly interested in the possibility of um, lack of a better term, co-opting from the field. I'm originally from Philly, and right before I left Philly to come to Rochester, there was a group of African immigrants who were forming a charter school because the African immigrant kids were getting beat up I agree. in the schools by the black American kids and all these ethnic issues, right? And so that community said, well, we need a safe space for our kids. Let's create a school. And I, I left so I didn't get to sort of follow it, but it kind of, I guess the seed got planted in me that while there are all types of ways in which charter schools are working against public education, there might be some ways for communities to use the system against themselves. I don't know if either of you have had a chance to look at um, uh, instances of that, or if that's even on the radar of people who are researching the charter. So I guess I just want to throw that out there. I mean, another example, Locally, the youth prep charter school um, that started last year and that has uh, mostly African American boys, but not the same team over there. And a lot of those boys were kids who got kicked out of other schools and this is kind of like the last stop for that. Um, and so, which, this is not dismissing all the critiques that were raised. I guess I just, I'm thinking maybe another way to think about this, given the momentum that's behind this, are there ways that some of us who want this mechanism to work for more progressive means can kind of co-opt it from within. I, I have some experience with that. And, uh, so for example, the sort of real grassroots people start a charter school, let's say they want to build a building. It's in the district, and I think this is going on in New York City. And KIPP also wants that building. <coughs> so what happens is, if you go back, to a magazine called Rethinking Schools, and when charter schools first started in 1995, 96, this was the discussion in the so progressive community was can we use this to do whatever it is we think is progressive. And what happens is that without the kind of financial backing, for example, if we got together in this room and started a charter school, which I wouldn't be opposed to, but I think we're going to come up against some realities that I don't have $8 million for insurance. <laughs> Okay, so where do you get that money? I know there was a, a shower we can speak to at a charter school that was started by teachers and they wanted to do science and they, they finally had to contract with an agency, an EMO, to make it happen. And they lost control of it. So if the question is, I think it's perfectly normal and we should fight for legislation that allows us to experiment in schools. I don't think that's what the current legislation is designed to allow us to do. And I think, I think the tactical question, I think, has to be very specific to your context. I won't take a stand against it one way or the other as a community or as a political person, because I can see in the community it being a viable thing. But from the perspective that I'm trying to get people to have a discussion, which is, you know, I really think there's a lot going on all at once. There's the wars, there's the, the privatization and the increase in prison, there's the economic collapse that's pending, and then there's the charter school thing. And, I worry about losing sight of the bigger picture of historic change that we're going through by getting caught up in the nuances of trying to do that. But I, I think in some communities it might be completely viable. I don't know. I think that's a tactic. Okay. I'll, I'll just add to that. Um, I think it's very understandable. You see this problem in the traditional public school, an idea pops into your head. I can do something much better. If only I had the ways and means to do it. Aha, here's the charter school mechanism. Let's go for it. Let's start it and create, and I'm not using this in a negative way, our own private paradise here. Let's create our own private paradise where we can have a school free of violence. That makes sense in that sense. But as Mark pointed out that, uh, you know, the, this school right here has been around God knows how long and how much money did it take to actually erect this school building and get this school building up and running. It takes millions of dollars to get a school up and running. So sooner or later, your average Joey, Louie, and everyone else is going to have to contract with people with a lot of money, and then, of course, you're going to become beholden to them. The other side of it from the literature is that you do have over 100 ethnic schools now, charter schools, and what they do is contribute further to this trend of segregation 
in the school system. So the existing school system is very segregated. The literature is showing it, but the charter school system is even more segregated. And so at, the, at one level, it makes sense because you want a safe environment for the kids. At another level, though, you are consciously, unconsciously, wittingly, unwittingly contributing to more segregation. And at the same time, it feeds into the problems of, look, you're going to have a charter school with no union. That's an attack on teachers in the union. You're going to take money away from the failing school district. So there's multiple levels to it. President, let me say something about that specific example. It's very problematic when you get two groups of African people, one from the continent, one from this place, transplants, making a decision to separate themselves from each other. That's a community problem and issue that needs to be dealt with, in this case, by African people, regardless of where they're from in diaspora. So that's the larger reality, or at least that's a part of it, that we should not lose sight of. Right. Um, my name is Fred and I just have a question for either one of you. Um, first, uh, a comment, and also in terms of what the gentleman said, is that in any time, I don't care what it is, you add money to an equation, the quality of whatever you started out with gets diluted. Mm -hmm. And if you allow charter schools to be privatized, that's exactly what's going to happen. And the education of our children is what's going to suffer in the end. By the time our kids leave high school, now you're into private institutions. And you can see from the disparities of colleges from MCC to U of R, how the education system is working. The quality of the education is miles apart from those two situations. And right now, looking at my situation, I have two children that would be ready to go to college in about 10 years. I made the conclusion that if I got a job at U of R, put in my years, that they would be able to go to that institution for free based on that reality. Now, a lot of parents doesn't have that option to be able to have be that fortunate to run into that kind of situation. So they're left with whatever's left on that end. Now my question, saying all that, my question is, seeing that you made the comment that those in power are the ones that makes the decision, how do we as a community break that down since we're not the ones that have the dollars? Well, I'm coming from a perspective reading the news and watching the national discussions and discussing with people who are generally in the dominant discussion about charter schools or any of the other stuff that are mentioned here about the so-called reform is that it becomes a debate about facts and it ignores mm -hmm. the central issue which is where, the, where does the power reside and maybe where, where it should change. So uh, you notice more and more if you pay attention that it actually is a, it's a you know, we're supposed to be data driven but the more they talk about being data driven the more they do exactly what they want irrespective data suggests. So that suggests to me, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna play that fool's game anymore. I don't want to talk about the data, I don't want to talk about the information, I want to talk about who decides. And at the end of the day, parents and communities should have uh, should have a direct say over the schools uh, that they have. And I think instead of going anti this or pro that, I think it's really a fundamental issue that's presenting itself in multiple arenas. And I want to see it being directly dealt with as a decision making issue. I don't want to simply tell people you don't have any power or push people that power. I want to say I think the debate should be about changing the way in which the decisions are made. So you can say school boards are corrupt. Fine, let's change it so that they involve more community people and they aren't corrupt. Why not change the democratic process so that it's less corrupt instead of saying, well, duh, democracy doesn't work in so many elections, which is what's going on now. So I, I really, you know, I don't mean to be um, too big picture, but I think things are changing so fast that we're not going to be able to contend with this issue or any related issues without dealing with it as a decision-making issue. And I think parents and teachers, parents and teachers are trying to be divided. That's what all this talk about performance pay is. And then the teachers are going to go against the parents that don't help their kids test scores go up so that they get money. It's to divide those people that have common interests. Right. And that's divide right. and conquer, pure and simple folks. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I know you didn't ask me, but Mark, <laughs> no, yeah, we did. We did. No, we, you probably, we didn't ask you. I just want to remind you. Right, we didn't ask you. Yeah, he articulated our position. Yeah, very we good. have taken that position that you don't consider the democratic institution to replace the individuals who are there. Uh, and so, what was another point? Which I forgot. I, I think that parents should be more educated about charter schools. I met a lady on the airplane a couple weeks ago. She said, I took my daughter out of the city school district. And I, you know, she was not, she put her in grief, but she put her in a charter school. You know, she thinks she took her out of the city school district and it's going to be a great school. And I don't think parents are educated to, it sounds good to them. You know, I can all what's behind charter schools and so people here, but I don't think a lot of parents do. Okay. I remember that point. So we've been saying, and I believe, hope you do, the only way that we're going to, and history shows it, have real input into the decisions is we must organize ourselves and develop a movement. I don't believe there's any other answer. I don't think there's any other answer. Yes, sir. Mark said that he would change the democratic process to be more responsive to public education. How would you do that? Well, I mean, at a school board level, yeah. There's, a, there's a whole there's a whole mindset about that. Uh, the first thing is that you know the system is set up to keep to de incentivize you to participate. And I think overall elections have been rendered as a, as a uh, controlled by these two political parties, which present us with you know at the end of the day similar options. And I think I would change that I would change in a general electoral process that eliminates. Uh, that kind of structure. I don't, there's nothing, if you read the Founding Fathers and all this stuff about being American, there's nothing about political parties. That's all made up after the fact. They didn't even believe in voting. They wanted to have a president chosen by a national university. The first seven presidents of the United States wanted to choose the president who the best and the brightest at a national university. The elections were something they, they did in the course of it. I think we, people, in general, need to say, how can we open up those elections so that they actually reflect will as opposed to gaming? The elections are a popularity contest and so on. And I think it's a cultural shift. And I do think information, I just have to say, because it bothers me, I didn't say anything, that there's momentum for charter schools is factually true and untrue at the same time. If there was momentum for charter schools, why do you have to bribe each state to change its laws? There is no momentum for charter schools. It's being imposed. It's, that's what, it's being imposed. Arnie Duncan called Louisiana and said, you're going to make this guy the superintendent. That's, he's not allowed to do that. I mean, he made a phone call and it was all nice and stuff. That's really bizarre with the federal executive who was appointed by the president to call a state and say, you're going to do this. I don't think, I don't think everybody's quite on board with that's a, that's a real political shift. There's no state strikes. There's local control. Any of that, that framework for discussing American politics has already been destroyed. Mr. McAleese, I have a question. Mr. McAleese, I structures at Joe Klein School over on Brooks Avenue in particular, mm -hmm. and they are sent right back yes. to the traditional system. Oh, yes. Many of them end up in the same jails that other that many other students who are in the traditional system end up in. Many of them end up in early grades and so forth. It's anecdotal, but it's not new. It's very old. You know the patterns. Mark is going to start the research tonight. <laughs> we have a question over here. Right here. 
I can't answer the second question, like what happens when they leave the public <coughs> school and go back to the public school, you know, what happens. I do know from uh, the students in my classes who uh, actually have taught in the area charter schools, some of them for more than two years, they always relate their experiences in the charter schools. And generally speaking, if they corroborate the research and the evidence that's out there in terms of the um, the push out rate, the counseling out of students, the high teacher turnover rates, and the, the, the problematic work conditions and the nutrition levels and so on and so forth. Um, so, so as Howard said, it's anecdotal or actually more than anecdotal, we're talking with people who've actually been in these schools and see firsthand experience uh, what's actually going on in those schools. I even had a student this, just this semester, she said that uh, uh, this one, I was not ready to hear this, but she said that her charter school gets students from another failing charter school. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they come from another failing charter school. Mm -hmm. And that even within the charter schools here, there's this notion that, well, this one's really military, militaristic and regimented and uniformed and really gung-ho, whereas this charter school's a, not so much. And, I, this is, this is, it's very important to understand another shift that's taking place in academia. So we're professors, yeah. so we, we do research, we're supposed to. So my students are supposed to do research, so I often say, well, let's go do research. And along these lines, of what's related to dropouts or school transition or what happens to student population A when they transition, there is an interesting thing. We want to go research what happens at charter schools. Okay, so I send a student to a school in Niagara Falls that's a charter school. He goes to the school to meet with the principal as is normal, say, we'd be interested in this kind of study, would you be willing? And he walks down the hall and he sees that there's cameras in every single room. And he says, as a normal person would, hey, what are the cameras in the room for? Immediately escorted from the building, as my college was called, and he insisted he was from the Buffalo News, and insisted that he never be allowed foot in the school again. So maybe we love the kids there but they certainly aren't going to let us in to see it. They don't want to. One of the things that's interesting about a public and private, if I want to get into a public school and I fight really hard, I can probably get in. From a charter school, and this is where my question comes in. I asked him why he was back, and he said he was expelled. I thought that they were not allowed to expel students or just say you can't stay here anymore. Is that true or not? Um, the charter schools definitely have overt and covert sophisticated and unsophisticated techniques for steering students out, counseling students out. And uh, I interviewed charter school teachers for, for my book. And uh, all of them pretty much spoke in detail to this issue of suspensions and expulsions. And uh, what you realize is that there's this uh, framework set up internally within the charter school system. It's already preset and predetermined how a paperwork trail is going to be laid out. And so first of all, you have the bad behavior problem student, or you have the poor test taker, or you have the special ed students who you eventually want to get rid of. And then you issue a reprimand, mm -hmm. knowing that that's going to go unheeded. So then that lays the groundwork for the next reprimand, that lays the groundwork for the next reprimand. And of course, you, you bring the parent in on this, knowing that the parent can't fulfill any responsibilities that they signed and were set up to fail to meet. And so long story short, the end game is already there. And so then they're pushed out, they're steered out in these subtle ways. And sometimes they're just told, you don't belong here. Because in reference to um, the newspaper, after being in the district so many years, I have friends that have been principals or VPs in charter schools. I have friends that have worked in charter schools that have closed. I think if you do research, you're going to find a lot of these schools closed. A lot of the teachers and the principals leave. One just stayed for six months. She was out of there. Um, it is kind of a dirty little secret. You you probably will really have to go in and start asking some more questions. Oh, that predetermined paper trail. It's no different than the than the uh, reprimands that's used in the Rochester City School District, except the in the Rochester City School District, it's a revolving door. In this situation. You go out the door at some point. Well, that's what I, but I heard somebody yeah. say to me that, oh, no, charter schools can't expel them. And I said, no, they can't. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
Well, yeah, one of the uh, really frustrating and but key points of all this, it has to do with this privatization issue. And in my own experience, one of the things that's really frustrating is that there's been privatization in a number of other systems, large systems in New York State, where they deinstitutionalized mental health. That was one of the things that they did. And uh, I'm not here to say, you know, the, uh, getting out of institutions is a bad, uh, bad thing. It's a good thing. We want people in the community. However, the, the parallels over these things is amazing. And yet we don't ever link, we don't learn from one system to carry over to the other to prevent something or to minimize it. So for instance, all these things were was named. Uh, the uh, kind of skimming of students or people with disabilities that uh, were demanding versus less demanding. Um, less oversight, the turnover of staff, and they, the state itself did a study in the late 80s, 80% 80 turnover in the private sector versus about 15% in the public sector. And they, I don't think that's actually changed. Busting of unions, big, 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 well they have no unions, so <laughs> the other side has no unions. Um, the uh, denial of transparency, and in some cases denial of constitutional rights for people to appeal decisions made by the system. Um, the other thing I was, one of the things that I remember really happening was really interesting. I was at a legislative session going back about 10, 12 years and talking to legislators about privatization. And sometimes you get one minute of truth about it. And, and this person some, said, excuse me, find some of that first. Okay, I, I'll get going. This person said that, um, this legislator said, well, you know what, by the time it, they figure out that they made a mistake, and if it's 20 years, think of all the money we've saved. In the, Yeah, a comment. It was just kind of ask why you mentioned that these policies aren't just popping up by random processes. They're being driven from the very top by Arnie Duncan and the Obama administration and so on. Um, you have to ask why are they doing that? Is it really that they are so enamored of the idea of the free market that you know actually is going to make a difference in education? Um, that's actually that, that's just the, the camouflage for what's really at stake is. There's massive profits to be made in yeah. education. The thing that stands in the way of the obstacle is people have some sort of expectation that they have a right to a public education, and they're well. We're, we'll see how how well we we awaken people to defending that right. Uh, that that is, they have to begin taking that apart if they're going to privatize what has been up till now something that is publicly accepted as, as something we all have in common. Um, and so it's kind of the, the modern day equivalent, if you will, of the seizure of the common land and the breakup of feudalism as capitalism begins. You can't make a profit off of something unless you privatize it somehow, unless you own it. And that's what this process is about. Um, and, and so it's a big, it's a class grab. It's about the rich and the very rich getting even richer at the expense of what happens to millions and millions of working class predominantly uh, kids. Growing up in the country, I mean, this is the, the scale and the scope that they're, they, they've embarked on this. And it's about time we, we do awaken the kind of social movements that we need to, to, uh, to make the difference. But secondly, the whole market idea is a phony theory. The market doesn't work whether it's for education or health care or for mortgage banking at certain points, as we know. Um, and, and, you know, the, mar the only way that the market actually does work and we see this as the result of 30 years of neoliberalism is, it increases inequality. It is an absolutely anti-democratic dynamic that has to be resisted in education and elsewhere. Yes, I accept that, except for we cannot put forth an idea that all working class people are suffering the same under these uh, stepped up efforts to privatize and so forth which makes it even harder to organize, but we have to be very clear about the reality. I got to, 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 I charter school movement up to the present uh, in the United States. And there will be a chapter in there by uh, Professor Ognemeni from Siena College who documents, provides a chronology of the first charter school in the state of New York and the history of its development and movement, its, its 
quite interesting. And uh, besides the factual information, besides his chapter, there's, there's going to be analysis of the historical, social, and political context of the charter school movement. And at the end, I'd like to end, there'll be a chapter that interviews charter school teachers and some principals so that it's so-called grounded and uh, comes from the experience of people who work in charter schools who can um, provide useful information to the public. And last but not least, I'm going to try to put forward a vision or an outlook that sort of counters this free market outlook uh, that, that's plaguing us today. What kind of outlook do we think we need to, to guide us? And, and just very briefly, I'll try to couch that all in the, the perspective of human rights. That education is a right, and uh, here are the things that I think we need to do to affirm that right, instead of using our choice and competition of consumers and uh, so on and so forth. Uh, information age rights. I think when, when one has these discussions like this, the question about why it's occurring comes up, and I would like to, I think it's very important to, to be uh, all sided in that. I don't think it's all about profit. Edison, for example, failed to make a profit in many considerations, and they still bailed out. Why? Uh, here's an example of how it can be complicated, and it's important for us to understand. If it was just to make a profit, why does the education of the working class African-American or Latino populations that end up in a KIPP school look a certain way. Well, what's the nature of that information? Uh, some people have described it as cultural eugenics. Now, why, why would, why would you know, all this talk about global competition, one has to be very careful about. There is a real thing called global competition, but it, it's might, it might not be understood by us as we, we assume a certain common understanding of that, but it's not you know, what you should be understanding. In other words, we talk about turnover in charter schools, and we recognize that as a bad thing for education. What if we ask the question, whose interest does that turnover serve? One of the things turnover serves to do is lower costs. It's bad for education, but it's good economics. People can't unionize. People in the TSA that I've talked to, transportation, they routinely fire them because it reduces costs. And it, uh, it, it, it mitigates their understanding that that's all bold. Now, in 1862 in England, something happened that was very important. What do we have now? We have merit pay for teachers, performance pay, test pay, pay. I bet you didn't know that we had a 30-year experiment of that in England from 1862 to 1898, and in Ireland all the way up until the uh, Irish split, political split in 1922. The reason, main impetus, was state control and to have a class-conscious system of education in the context of the failed Crimean War. They had a tremendous run on the coffers of the state treasury, and they consciously needed a system to reduce the cost to education. So they tied teachers' compensation to test scores. When the teachers had too many students pass the tests, they made them part of This is a well-documented but rarely discussed historical thing. You can't understand the charter schools and the merit pay thing, so-called, unless you also understand the increasing militarization and police state arrangements that are taking place inside the schools. So there's a broad social sift. If you look at the rhetoric of college and career ready of the administration, it's not about anything remotely democratic. It's a new social order that's being born, and it has, it's not just to make money. If they lose money, they're still going to do it. Yeah, that's right. Very, very interesting. Cultural yeah. eugenics. Yeah. Yes, my brother. Uh, if you go into certain schools in Rochester, such as the I'm Ready program, it looks just like somebody's being conditioned to go to jail. It operates basically the same way as the jail operates. So this, this is real. This is very real. We hope that all the profiteers and the reformers will buy Dr. Tell's books so we can afford to give them to us free. All right, Ricardo was next. Um, I just had to respond to them, giving them Obama and Arnie Duncan too much credit. They are not the top. It's way above them that's running the show. The fact when Obama burps, they have a complaint about that. They have not complained about his education policy. That ought to tell you something's wrong with it. <laughs> that ought to tell you. The Republicans and Tea Party, they're not complaining about his education policy. It's way bigger than Obama. For real. Um, and I really don't care about people um, being innovative and trying to find new things, but don't try to take over the school system where my kids go. Where my kids go. 
You're just squeezing them out. I'm afraid. I got two that's just starting. I'm afraid. I don't want them to teach them to the test, man. I want them to learn something. You know, um, I failed. I, didn't, I fell through the system. Um, the one answer that I have, because from my community work, the people really do get it. They just have kind of given up. Um, don't think their voice matters. If we put some kind of effort in to changing the voting process, like they did with this census, it was unbelievable how they pushed and got everybody's input about the census. If they got everybody's input, they to ask who you're going to vote for, and took the votes right there, boy, it'll change a whole lot of shit because the, the people really get to voice their opinion, a lot of stuff will change. But we need to revamp the voting because it's built now to keep people out of voting. As soon as somebody, they have an election, another million dollars is spent eliminating um, registered voters. Well, you know what I'm saying? If the money, you know, all of these games, if you really hear from the people, they really do get it. The people in my neighborhood really get it. And I just, that's what we really need to change this whole voting system to accommodate the people who ain't going to the pool and really get to hear what the people have to say. For the Rochester Career Mentor uh, Charter, um, is this charter, is there any intention for that to be co co the co-location? No, and I'm glad you brought that up. Right now, the board is not containing, the board is not containing anything about any charter that's being co-located, um, any, any charter that's being co-located in district space at all. A 